There's one topic that I get asked a lot about, and that is reproductive immunology. And there's one world-renowned specialist that people have been telling me to talk to for, it seems like years now, and that's Dr. Andrea Vidali. And he's gonna come on today, you guys. I'm so honored to have him on today's show to talk about the field of reproductive immunology and the new platform that he's created called Pregmune. Get it? Pregnancy and immune. Pregmune. You guys can go to pregmune.com, learn more about what he's doing. And it's basically a resource for patients. He's the resource for him to provide consults for people who just have that gut feeling that there might be something wrong, but they just can't put their finger on it. And he's someone that's hopefully going to be teaching more doctors like me about what tests we can order for our patients so we can give our patients more clarity when there might be something wrong that we just can't figure out. You guys know that I always say there's no such thing as unexplained, just we haven't explained it enough. So I'm really honored that he's going to be joining me today. Jaya Vidali, he's from New York, and he's going to spend some time with us today just talking about what he's doing, how he's doing it, and how you guys can learn more. There he is. Hi, Andrea. Hey, how are so you? How are you? It is so nice on? to how see you. you? <laughs> I'm doing great. And what's that behind you? Oh, yes, of course. Moo, moo, moo. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I love cows. You know, I love hiking. In the, um, I love hiking. I love the mountains. And, uh, mm -hmm. and so... Um, uh, a, a patient um, who, who knew that uh, uh, her father is a wonderful artist and um, it's on my it's on my feet actually and and he 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 made this for me and I love it I absolutely love it I mean I've heard of people giving people mugs and pineapples but a cow portrait that's quite that's fun <laughs> <laughs> That's fun. Well, thank you for joining us today. I want to talk about Pregmune and why you started. But before I get, even get into that, can you just tell us about yourself? I mean, you have such an impressive CV. So just tell us, I mean, you, you started med school, what, at 23? Or you completed finished, it, actually. You finished, finished, finished it. it. Yeah. At, it, I would say that uh, my, my career has followed a, a certain a path, right? I think that... And uh, it's been like, a, it's, it, it's, it's funny because today I was, I was riding my bike, right? I was riding my bike and I was thinking about, uh, I was actually listening an interview. <laughs> I was listening to an interview of, of the, the jazz guitar player, Pat Metheny, right? And uh, he was talking about how, of course, at a very different level, he's truly a great master and, you know, number one in the world, you know, probably one of the greatest guitar players. But... You know, he was talking about how, like, you're following a certain path in life, right? And I think that, um, I feel that my life did take a path where I found a, a certain interest and then I, I pursued it and it's gone progressively better for me in the sense that I've lo I love it even more. It's, it's, you know, when you do what you love, and I know you, you love what you do because here we are, it's Sunday afternoon, right? You know, and we're here because we love what we do, right? We enjoy, we enjoy it. Otherwise, we would be doing it. And certainly not on a Sunday, right? right. And uh, and uh, and you, the more you do it, the more you enjoy doing it. The more you you feel fulfilled from what you're learning every day. And um, you know, I started as a sort of traditional fertility IVF doctor, if you will, right? And then, um, of course. I got interested in surgery. Everybody knows that, you know, endometriosis is like my thing and reproductive immunology and how that sort of like that science, which my eyes were open to it, you know, like, a, 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 like we were talking about it when we first started doing this stuff, like a few years ago, people were like, oh, immunology, oh, BS, you know, no good, right? And then sort of like we started discovering more and more how that plays a role, how important it is to actually look into deeper into things and and uh, and sort of like that sort of discovering that and, and doing that every day and then the interaction with people. I think that both, I, I believe that both you and I value that immensely and, and uh, the feedback and, and uh, helping people. And uh, it, it's been, Let's say it's been an amazing journey. Has it been a yeah. great journey for you too? It has been. I'm always trying to create ways to help patients and you certainly have as well with Pregmune. So for people who don't know about Pregmune, tell us about it. 
Well, what, what I did with Pregimmune, what my idea was that as a reproductive immunology, a pe immunologist, people would come to me and say, hey, um, you know, let's, let's figure out what's going on, right? And I would do the testing. And, and, you know, I started this with Dr. Jeffrey Braverman, who was like an infant prodige. He finished, he went to, he went to college at 14, okay? Like the guy was a genius, right? He was the earliest graduate from NYU. He unfortunately passed. And uh, over the years, we, we developed sort of an algorithm, like the way we looked at immunology in a holistic way. Because when you look at immunology, you know, like everything, it's almost like when you do a fertility workup, you're looking at different factors. And you say, based on this factor, that factor, and that factor, this is what we think you should do. Immunology is the same, right? You're looking at different things based on the genetic, the serological evidence of, uh, of, of uh, autoimmunity, based on inflammatory levels based on your nutrition, this is what our picture is, and this is what you should do. It's the same thing, right? We, we would do that. It would take us hours, we would have weekly meetings, and then I was like, how can we do this? How can we do this in a way that the same, well, what I did in my practice, a, 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 any doctor can do, and this is what, what we put together, which is really, we generate a report, which you go to a lab, you go to Quest to, and LabCorp, these two labs, national level labs, we order the labs, we analyze and we provide a report very detailed that your doctor can use to recommend treatment, to recommend nutritional changes, to recommend pretty much everything you could do to improve your chance of not having a miscarriage or having a, or, or enhancing implantation uh, of, from the lens of immunology, from the perspective of immunology. And like we, you know, like we, we were talking a little earlier, you and I, we we're talking about every intervention is incremental, right? You know, I think this is why it's important, I think, to look at things from a um, holistic standpoint, right? You know, you, you know, when I say holistic, I mean, you're looking at the person as a whole. You're looking at the whole, at the big picture, and you, and you try to put everything together and try to bring in the interventions that are, are actually helpful and, you know, who have been proven to be helpful. Right. And I went to your website. Mm -hmm. As you can imagine, I did before mm -hmm. I brought you on. Mm -hmm. And there are six items on the site that, that you talk about that might interfere with someone's ability to conceive. Can we talk a little mm -hmm. bit about this? Sure, things? let's okay. go. Okay. So the parental compatibility, mm -hmm. HLA mismatches. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. Whenever, whenever you're looking at uh, the example of this, the quintessential example of that is transplant, right? You know, when you're looking for the ideal candidate for transplant, uh, you're looking for somebody that is, uh, you know, a, a good match, right? You know, like we use this term like very sort of like in a way that is very um, unscientific, but what basically uh, the, the principle is clear to understand, right? You know, you, when you're getting a transplant, you want that, that transplanted organ, whatever that may be, or bone marrow to be the more similar mm -hmm. to you as possible. Mm -hmm. Okay, when it comes to the reproductive component of this, it's actually not exactly like that. Mostly because in order for the process of tolerance to develop properly, uh, there have to be certain conditions need to be met. And uh, uh, one of the conditions is that the perfect match is not the, the ideal situation. How was this originally discovered? It's an interesting historical factoid. This was done on the, in many fertility studies were done on, a, on se se selected sequestered pop populations where there's a lot of consanguinity, where people are, uh, you know, because of where they live and their religion, they have a tendency to uh, marry amongst sort of like uh, closer, I don't, I don't want to say relatives, but closer in terms right. of, uh, and the, you know, people, the Hittites, which is, it's, it's basically uh, like Amish, it's mm -hmm. Amish. Uh, like the Amish are in Pennsylvania, the Hittites are in Florida. They were studied, um, you know, as a population, uh, um, mostly because of this reason that, you know, it's sort of like a, a real world sort of experimental model. And they noticed that, you know, there were increased incidence of miscarriages when there were <laughs> increased matches. And that's how started this, this whole thing. So that's one part of it, right? The compatibility mm -hmm. and, the, and the HLA match. And somebody's a full HLA match, it's it's uh, it, it's it's proven science that there's an increased risk of pregnancy loss and and, and reduced implantation, um, uh, especially if our other certain conditions are met. Right. Mm. There's about, other risk factors. Yeah. What about natural killer cell or cytotoxic mm. activity? Well, uh, mm, 
natural in in my in my opinion natural killer cell levels are not as reliable as the genetics that we just talked about earlier mostly because the test that gets normally ordered by a lot of doctors is this test called and i'm, I'm mentioning this because of who is listening to us today and they uh, they know about this test nka nka natural killer the natural killer cells are part of the what's called the uh, innate immune system it's where it's immune, it's a part of our immune system as opposed to the adaptive immune system. The innate immune system is the system that sort of attacks whatever gets thrown at it. So any bacteria that enters the body and also cancer cells are naturally attacked by these cells, right? And there's many subgroups. It's not like one big group. Depending on the surface receptors, you know, you'll read these numbers like CD56, et cetera, et cetera. Depending on these surface receptors, they, they are different groups of them. But these cells, uh, uh, the, the, they've been put, the, the number of these cells in the, in the circulating body has been put in relationship with increased pregnancy losses. But NKA doesn't measure that. It measure an in vitro ability of these cells to kill, to neutralize a certain cell line, cancer cell line, mm -hmm. hematological cell line. So it's really not a very good test in general. And I certainly wouldn't make great decisions just based on that. Um, but, you know, it's like one little piece of the puzzle. Let's put it That's there. interesting. Because I think most reproductive immunologists, if I had a toolbox here, that's the only tool that I have, right? I know. I, I think it's overused. And I think, uh, uh, you know, and this is my medical opinion. My scientific opinion is that I think that you, I wouldn't just base it just on that. Yeah. I mm -hmm. think it's overused. And I, I you know, in my opinion, it's, um, it's not the only test. You know, one of the most difficult parts, I think, of... Uh, immunological treatment in general is monitoring the treatment, right? You know, because obviously, um, you know, obviously you could treat two ways, right? You know, you could just say, based on these findings, I'm going to give you this treatment. Let's see if it worked, right? You know, see if it works. It works, it doesn't work, you know, but obviously people always say, why? Why didn't it work? So then there's, uh, you know, the whole field of looking at why it didn't work and looking at the immune response to that. And, in our data, in our data, internal data, um, uh, we didn't really see the NK being very relevant um, in the context of implantation failure or recurrent pregnancy loss. We look at other cy cytokines and there's other, um, other cell groups, we, we, levels of certain cytokines, which are mediators of inflammation, have been more predictive of outcomes in our scientific evidence that we have looked at in our personal studies. And that's what we look at. And what about egg quality? I've heard that, I've heard mm -hmm. this before, and I, I, I don't feel mm -hmm. that I, I can say that I agree, but I'm just curious mm -hmm. what you say, that mm -hmm. um, treating an NK cell abnormality, let's call it, can improve egg quality. Is there any truth to that? No, not okay. in my opinion. Okay. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Okay. The next factor that you guys look at or you look at is systemic inflammation. What does that mean? Uh, well, when you're looking at, um, when you talk about the immune system, right, or, you know, a hyperactive immune system, you, you ultimately you have to talk about inflammation, right? And when you talk about inflammation, uh, you talk about, a, a again, like a holistic perspective, right? Some of it is your own your own hyperactive immune system. So for example, production of certain high levels of certain uh, or aberrant, aberrant behavior or certain cells, certain inflammatory cells. Uh, and, uh, you know, some of these, uh, you know, some of these cells can be um, uh, overrepresented and they show like an increased level of systemic inflammation, right? One of these tests that you'll see is like Th1, Th2. You, you may have heard about that, right? right. You know, right. these are, you know, you know, and, uh, and these are T helper cells, right? So like it's, you know, there's different groups of them and it's proven science that when you have a aberrant behavior, when you're like on the extreme, either on one side or the other, that's a sign of increased systemic inflammation. Like an example would be lupus, which would have very, very high Th2 levels. Okay, that's one example. Mm -hmm. um, uh, endometriosis would be more on the Th1 side so that we understand ourselves. Um, but also like nutritionally, and we look at, for example, omega-3, omega-6 levels. Uh, so that, you know, because obviously there's, people say, well, take fish oil, it's gonna, you know, you know incre increase, you know, improve your, your balance, omega-3, omega-3, but you know, 
yes, empirically that's correct, but you know, at least you can look at it factually and then look scientifically, both from the female and the male. Um, because I do think that we don't talk about enough about the male, to be honest mm -hmm. with you. The other partner, the, the famous, you know, absent partner in many in many ways, and, and sometimes interventions on the partner can improve sperm quality. I mean, right. unfortunately, it's like a lengthy process, but uh, maybe worth you know looking into. But that's how we look at it when we look at infl the whole o overall inflammation. Okay, and then the next item on your list is thrombophilia. What does that mean, and how do you check it? Uh, thrombophilia means a tendency towards hypercoagulability, right? Now. Actual tendency towards hypercoagulation is actually relatively rare, right? So that's why the American College, you know, a, um, sorry, ASRM doesn't recommend standard thrombophilia testing, okay? Uh, but we're not really looking at thrombophilia. We, we, we're, we're, when we're talking about, when we talk about implantation, is the micro, is like hypercoagulation at the, at the micro level, right? So on a macro level, you may not be at risk of throwing a claw in your legs. We all agree on that. That's rare. But we do know that there are certain uh, combination of genes that increase uh, a thrombophilia level event at the level of the fetal placental, uh, maternal, maternal placental uh, interface. Those are microvasculature, like things have to flow smoothly in there. And that's where looking, uh, of course, if there's a history, there's certain risk factors, that's why looking at that is relevant. That's why there, there are known risk factors for that that can be easily corrected, whether it's baby aspirin or, a, um, or Lovenox, depending on the severity and the history and everything else. That's certainly indicated. Right. And what's regulatory T cell? That's another factor that you look at. Regulatory T cells are probably the most important cells uh, that play a role in uh, development of tolerance, okay? Um, the, the, the issue about regulatory T cells is that these cells circulate in the body and uh, they, they play at the interface between the actual target, in which case is the embryo, and the cells that can potentially attack it, which you know, could, could be you know, potentially you know, like natural killer cells or other cells, right? That secrete cytokines that ultimately can you know, damage the embryo in different ways. Um, these cells migrate from the circulation into the uterus, okay? Because we cannot measure uterine, you know, uterine regu T, T regulatory cells because people are pregnant. We can't just go in there and, you know, manipulate, right? So uh, what we look at is we look at this migration. We know that there's, uh, when, when somebody gets pregnant successfully, there's a, a drop in the levels of these T regulatory cells, a significant drop, a 60% drop actually. And we track that. So it's something that uh, we've been working for many years and we, we have seen this connection and it's a known, it's a known relationship, yes. And then Interesting what about, stuff. Yeah, I think this is, I mean, I could talk to you all day, honestly. Autoimmunity, that's the sixth item on your site. Tell us right. about that. Autoimmunity is actually actual pathology, right? Autoimmunity is, uh, is, is, there autoimmune, is there a evidence of autoimmune disease in the person? Many, first of all, how do, how do I know if I'm at risk for autoimmunity, right? First of all, you, you have to, I, have to, I would have to look at my family history, right? Because uh, there's a, her, a heritability of autoimmune conditions. And so uh, certainly the family history is extremely important. Uh, the second fact that we have to look at is that autoimmunity is actually more frequent in in uh, people of the f uh, of the female uh, female gender, you know, uh, 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 and uh, the and it's because the immune system is more plastic, and there's a number of reasons. But basically, people sometimes have unknown autoimmune conditions; they're not aware that they have it. People could be walking around with rheumatoid arthritis and not know it. People could be walking around with antiphospholipid. Uh, uh, elevated levels of antiphospholipid antibodies and not know it, um, especially because autoimmune conditions have a tendency to present themselves later in life. Uh, so uh, what's interesting to note is that, that individuals who've had, for example, reproductive problems, uh, lots of miscarriages or pregnancy complications, or for example, who have endometriosis, another example, later in life, they have a higher incidence of autoimmune conditions. 
uh, and I'm talking about Crohn's disease, mm -hmm. ulcerative colitis, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis. In there, these things happen in the, you know, the pregnancy complications happen in the 30s, early 40s, and then late 40s and 50s, you, these other things start popping up. We look at the genetics for, for a genetic predisposition risk, but we also look at the actual diagnostics for these conditions. So all of this kind of puts a picture together. And I think this is, I mean, this is extremely complete. This is way more than I could do for a patient of mine. So let's say I refer a patient of mine to you. What's their next step? Well, if you're a patient to Pregimmune, basically what happens is that the patient would uh, obtain a report and you as a doctor would ob obtain a report that then you can act upon. You, can get, you will get a bird's eye view of what's happening, everything we just discussed, and then make the, the appropriate interventions, which may be no intervention, or it may be a simple intervention like a baby aspirin or um, a blood thinner, for example, or it may be something more complex like drugs like like IVIG, for example, which is something that you know many have heard about, uh, which obviously uh, require a higher level of complexity, and some of them unfortunately are expensive, and and it, it can be very stressful. But in the end, look, if there's been failures at some point, you need to find some solutions, and and uh, they have to be, of course, evidence based. But that's what we are talking about, obviously. Right, and I know a lot of patients, especially mine, um, want to know how can they do things naturally, like without using IVIG, for example, you mentioned a little bit about diet. Is there something that people can do with their lifestyle to give themselves the best chance of decreasing their risk of having any of these issues? 100%, of course. I mean, that should be the first step. I mean, okay. you know, I think that that is, you know, like, of course, when we're talking, when you get to IVIG, of course, it also means that everything else has, you know, has not worked out and there's significant evidence of a problem. But I think that obviously, Whatever, when you're looking at the, at the whole picture, the holistic picture of like, the, when we talk about inflammation, of course, everything we put in our body plays an enormous role, an enormous role in what's happening with our inflammatory, uh, with our inflammation status, you know? And uh, uh, clearly we all know that our intestine is a, an immune organ. And so like the interaction, it's an, this interface is, is, is vitally important. And uh, so this is why, obviously, I think the first step always should be nutritional. There's no question about it. And, uh, you know, I'm not gonna talk about supplements. It's a completely different conversation where you really are the expert in that, but, you know, and certainly not me, but, um, you know, I, I would say that definitely that has to be, you know, the first, the very first step and probably, maybe probably the most important step. And at what point, you know, you probably know I have this method. It's called the tushy method, right? Yes. And I feel like I should change it to the twishy method, like squishy <laughs> method, put a little I after the U. But my question to you is, at what point would you recommend investigating with doing all the testing with a reproductive immunologist like you? I think, Amy, it's, it has to be decided on a case-by-case -case basis. I think that um, it's up to the doctor. It's up to, you know, there's different sort of what people have been through, what their personal history is, what their family history is, uh, what their reproductive history is, the age, all these things have, be put to, have to be put together, obviously, to, in order to make these decisions. You know, I, I don't, you know, obviously, and, and also the personal choice. I mean, some people say, look, I want to have every test under the world done. And uh, I, don't, I don't question that approach, you know, especially because today, obviously, um, the IVF approach has, has gone to the point where basically people are just banking, banking, banking. Mm -hmm. So when the transfer comes, it's like, oh my God, we've banked so much and now the transfer comes. There's so much pressure to just get everything done, which I understand that. But I think it's really up to the doctor and, you know, only you can decide with your patient what, you know, what the ideal case scenario really is. Truly, truly. Um, other questions? Is this testing good for someone who has, let's say, recurrent implantation failure? Do you see that, that there's a role with that or is it more for the recurrent pregnancy loss patient? Because I see both types of patients and yeah. I know that they yeah. ask me if they should have this workup or not. What do you think? 100%. I mean, I think, you know, recurrent pregnancy loss, one thing that we have, to, and I'll, I'll be very brief, recurrent pregnancy loss, the chance of success, even after three losses it, of having a, a successful pregnancy is pretty high. Okay, and this has been because it's pretty high. Uh, this has always 
you know, doctors always say, well, keep on trying, keep on trying. But one thing that people don't know is that the average time to pregnancy after three losses is five years. Okay. It's a long time. And people sometimes don't have five years. So, you know, this is an important consideration to be made. So like, you know, and, and that's why I said like, you know, that's recurrent pregnancy loss is one area. When you're looking at implantation failure, um, I think that uh, especially today, when you start having implant, it's not more random implant. A lot of the studies of implantation failures are not done with PGS normal embryos, okay? And I know that there's recent evidence, people are saying, well, if the embryos are normal, you could just keep on trying and see what happens and you'll be successful. But that's the same idea of telling people, keep on trying with your miscarriages and you'll be successful in five years. You know, I don't have five years and I don't have 20 embryos, okay? So this is really the dilemma there. I think, you know, it, which is that if you have the luxury that you have, you're sitting on six, seven PGS, PGT normal embryos, maybe you have the luxury of the try, keep on trying and, you know, approach because you, you, you could quote unquote always make more. But if you're the individual who has made, uh, who has had to do three retrievals and now you have your two embryos, I think that uh, looking at implantation, you know, at corrective actions for implantation failure is, is definitely worthy. And there's actual evidence on immunological treatment for implantation failures, randomized prospective studies. I want to make it very clear. Yes. Well, I was going to ask you this next question, but someone actually just answered it. They said, I'm a patient of Dr. Vidali and I'm 30 weeks pregnant tomorrow because of these protocols. And I was going to ask you what kind of improvements <laughs> have you seen? <laughs> well, I yeah. think that answers that question. Mm -hmm. Well, so. that's really nice. And whoever you are, thank you. <laughs> Well, That's really you. nice words to say. <laughs> well, thank you for your time today on this Sunday. I really appreciate thank you. all that. Is there so anything, much. Of course. Is there anything else you want to share with, with the uh, folks that are listening to us today before we sign uh, off? Our, our mantra, Amy, never accept, unex, accept unexplained as a, an answer, right? I, that's our mantra. I think it's an important mantra. I think we should repeat that. Yeah, good. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you again. We'll have a lovely Thank day. you so much for your time. Thank you thank again. You. Anytime. Okay. Bye, everybody. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye.